today. Um, this is our last lecture in the uh, Native Voices lecture series. Um, there's going to be a um, Patient Voices panel next week on, um, on Thursday at noon, but this is the last lecture, so we'll um, celebrate that. And um, uh, today we are um, very pleased to have Dr. Lillian Tom Orm, who is today, and she's PhD, MPH, RN, and FAAN, and Research Assistant Professor in the Division of Epidemiology in the School of Medicine. And she, her research interests include health disparity issues, transcultural health and cancer and diabetes care in Native Americans. She currently has membership in, this is a long list, American <laughs> Public Health Association, American Diabetes Association, the Network for Cancer Researchers Among American Indian and Alaska Native Populations, National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nurses Association, the National Alaska Native and American Indian Nurses Association, and Transcultural Nursing Society. She has served on the Minority Women's Health Panel of Experts of the Department of Health and Human Services and the Advisory Board for the National Institute of Minority Health Disparities and as Native American Research Liaison for the National Cancer Institute. She is a co-founder of the Native Research Network and currently serves as its co-chair. So Dr. Lillian Tom Orm will talk to us about health disparities in American Indians and Alaska Natives and how do we close the gap. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jill. Um, so thank you to Joan and Dr. Lopez and others who've uh, made this possible. And uh, it's not very often, I think, that American Indian and Alaska Natives are talked about in public like this. A lot of times we're <laughs> grouped under other and <laughs> not seen or not heard from. Um, so um, I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers in terms of health disparities. I think. Um, Previous speakers have touched on a lot of this and given you some of those uh, numbers. Um, and so, you know, what I want to do is just uh, look at some ways that we might be able to um, use some of these uh, figures with disparities and, and uh, explore, you know, how we begin to uh, make a difference in uh, the health disparities among uh, the native populations. Um, so, what I would like to do, and, and I think other speakers might have done this, is, you know, Native people like to think in circles, um, and so that's what I'll do, um, is try to use um, the Diné uh, philosophy, and again, you know, it's a circular way of thinking, and it's directional as well. Um, for instance, um, uh, East, you know, we usually begin with that. Ntsahakes means uh, the, the Navajo word, uh, consciousness or thought. And a lot of times it's really difficult to um, translate um, some of these words or these concepts, but um, this is, I think, you know, the best we can do. Nahat'ah uh, means south, um, planning or taking action. Ina is west, um, the purpose of life, existence. C has sent to the North stability um, balance, and, and I think it's w very well represented in this basket. Um, Navajo people say, you know, when you have this basket, you always have that opening uh, to the east because that's the, the direction that you um, wake up and go towards in the morning. Um, the belief is you run to the east and you think about all the opportunities that are out there for you that day and then pray that um, um, that you will come across some of these opportunities and think of ways that you can better yourself as well as your your fellow um, uh, humans. Um, so let's take a look at some definitions. Um, I think in all of the, the issues we deal with in uh, American Eden and Alaska Native, um, and even, um, I just came from the American Public Health Association where we include the Native Hawaiians. So when we talk about our health, um, we always address you know, our sovereignty as well. I think it's, uh, that is very uh, important in whatever, we, um, whatever issues we discuss. 
Um, and our tribal sovereignty, you know, actually, you know, if you look at um, the history of uh, the American Indians and, and the right relationship with the U.S. government, um, this is where, you know, sovereignty is really uh, formalized within the um, U.S. Supreme Court, uh, or some cases that came out at the, the Southeast with the Cherokee Nation. Um, health disparities as, um, is, is a huge thing. Um, at the American Public Health Association, we talked a lot about disparities um, and how we you know, take a look at all these things that um, affect um, our health and why we experience disparities. I mean, there's a lot of disadvantage in, in all kinds of ways you can uh, think of our health, you know, socially, economically, environmentally. Um, even sexual orientation, gender identity, all these things factor in um, into how we define and experience health. Um, some of the work um, that we've done in public health, I, I'm a public health person, I work, you know, I always work in public health and, and uh, so um, when we, I worked for the state health department for a number of years became I, before I came to the university. So when we um, do planning, we've always gone to the healthy people, you know, back then it was 2000. And this was the, our major goal is to reduce um, health disparities among all Americans. And so when we started planning for healthy people 2010, we said we're not only gonna eliminate um, not just redu or we're going to eliminate, not just reduce health disparities. We're going to get rid of it. So have we done that? No, we haven't. Um, so now we're looking at uh, Healthy People 2020, and our goal this time is to achieve health equity um, and eliminate disparities and improve the health of all groups. So this is where we, we actually begin to look at at groups, you know, before it was um, reducing health disparities among Americans, and we've never really identified who the Americans are. Uh, now people are saying, let's disaggregate all these data that we're looking at um, because it tells the story better if we um, pull groups of people out, for instance, the Native Hawaiians, the American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and take a look at those disparity issues. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, health equity is um, something that we're also talking about right now. A lot of discussions were on health to, um, equity issues at the American Public Health Association in the last um, few days. Um, and, you know, a lot of that has also to do with policy, um, health policy. So um, there are all kinds of ways people uh, define health. And you know, I'm sure you've uh, seen this definition by the World Health Organization. Um, you know, some people don't like that, um, and so there are people looking at you know how can we in this day and age um, begin to um, kind of modify that World Health Organization definition because we're now um, living longer. Uh, we are living with um, chronic conditions. We're not free of all these um, illnesses and chronic conditions. We can manage them and, and still say that we're healthy. So perhaps we ought to um, redefine that um, definition is what people are saying. Um, determinants of health, um, and this is another area that um, was discussed at the meeting that I just went to. Um, whatever, um, however we define our health, you know, biologically, uh, genetically, indivi our, our individual behavior, all of that, um, those things are related to various things in our environment, our, the health services we seek, the health status we are trying to achieve, our socioeconomic status, the our physical environment, discrimination, racism, a lot of discussions about uh, racism um, in, in health um, this past week. Um, and other influences um, that I couldn't list on the other slide um, that are part of the, the definition for the um, determinants of health. Um, location, you know, where you live has a lot to, um, say about how your health is. 
Um, there are also some words um, that we're beginning to hear about, for instance, food insecurity. You know, what does that mean? Um, people are talking about how we live, you know, some populations live in um, food deserts. Um, and, uh, and that this is uh, different from uh, the definition of hunger. Um, child poverty, uh, when you look at um, rates of child poverty, you know, there are certain segments of the population where these rates are higher than in, in other populations. Um, and, um, you know, you might be surprised that the U.S. has high, higher rates of child poverty than some other countries. So going to the south, you know, what do we do about this? Um, you might have read some of these um, headlines not too long ago when that uh, Yellow River um, started flowing from the Animas, um, from the mountains. And it's to the Navajos, that those mountains, the San Juan Mountains in Colorado is one of the four sacred mountains. And so we, you know, saw the origin of this yellow contaminated uh, river coming out of one of our sacred mountains and coming right through Navajo land. And so these are there's some of the, the headlines um, that uh, people saw. So looking at the state of Utah and the Utah uh, American Indian Alaska Native populations, um, everything on your left are rates for the native populations and everything on your right is for the state of Utah and you can see the disparities there, the huge differences in numbers. For instance, the uh, death rates from diabetes, um, two times as high in American Indian populations. Um, asthma is higher. So when you look at this, think of all those determinants of health. Think of the environment that these people are living in. Think of the socioeconomic status. Think of the child poverty rates. Um, the large number of um, children in these families, the housing that they live in, the transportation um, that they have or don't have, the health care access. So all that is reflected in these numbers. And I think for, for today now, we can't just look at these numbers and say, you know, diabetes rates are twice as high. You know, what's behind those numbers? Uh, what are those uh, determinants of health? Um, cigarette smoking is higher in American Indian populations. Um, this is interesting because when you go into the northern plains, it's really high. And uh, the southwest has a very low rate of smoking, the southwest um, native people. But, um, but still, you know, this is, this is higher than the state um, rates. Um, no physical activity, so everything listed over there um, you know, is very different from this other column. Um, this is something that, that I came across that I kind of like. Um, Robin Wood Johnson came up with this um, way of looking at the county health. You know, how can we take a look at our county and, and look at the population's health at that level? And they did some work with the University of Wisconsin and um, I used this, I, I worked with a, a lawyer this past year uh, looking at some of the um, health disparities between uh, the Navajo people living in San Juan County versus the rest of San Juan County. So, um, so here's some um, social and economic factors and, and these are some of the factors they looked at like education, employment, income, family, social support, community safety. Um, so the healthiest counties, you know, you usually find higher college attendance, 6% um, or less of the adults are unemployed, fewer children living in poverty, 25% or less of children living in single parent households, and less violent crime. So those are the healthiest counties, and you can see over here at the end, um, some of the factors that are associated with the unhealthy uh, counties. So looking at San Juan County, um, the yellow highlights are um, San Juan County and the green um, are for the state of Utah. And this is looking at all the counties in Utah and San Juan County ranked 27th out of 27th. 
um, like I said, I picked this because I was working down there, and um, and it turns out it was you know one of the unhealthy or the unhealthiest county throughout the whole whole state, and the majority of the population there um, is ethnic, mostly Native Americans, mostly Navajo, a few Utes and other tribes, um, a few Hispanics, but again. Um, the red and the highlighted yellow, um, those are very uh, different from, from the Utah rates. Um, for instance, high school graduation is lower than the state rate. There's some college, but uh, still low. There is a local college um, that got started because of the high number of students who were wanting to go to college, but college is so far away for them. You know, they're down in southeast Utah, and they'd have to go to Price or up here. And, um, and, and so there was a college started down there. Um, unemployment rate is high. Uh, children in poverty, income inequality. Um, violent crime is lower. You know, you can, I think, understand that because um, much of Utah, I think, is, is urban. Um, Social associations, I looked that up and, and it's really, you know, how you relate to other people. You know, are you a loner or not? <laughs> and and that's, they seem to be doing well down there. <laughs> I think they live in large um, family, large households. So, um, again, looking at health behaviors, tobacco use, diet and exercise, alcohol and drug use, sexual activity. And so you can see the characteristics of the healthiest counties and then the unhealthiest. And so looking at San Juan County, this is what it looks like. Um, adult smoking, not, not a big difference. Uh, obesity, I was surprised that it was the same for San Juan County and the rest of Utah. Um, food environment, um, food index is lower there. Um, when I drove around throughout San Juan County in, in the more rural areas, um, there just weren't any restaurants, you know, any sit-down places. It's usually small um, convenience stores and uh, just, I mean, I walk around and I can't really find anything to eat, you know, that I, I wanted. So, it, you know, no grocery stores. Um, access to exercise opportunities, um, excessive drinking, just slightly lower, not, not a big difference, which surprised me also. Um, sexually transmitted infectious diseases, teen births is higher. And then looking at clinical care, access to care and quality of care. Um, this I found interesting as well. When you look at, um, of course, uninsurance rates that, you know, I, I, I understand that it's higher down, down in San Juan County. But when you look at the primary care physicians and dentists, they're doing a lot better than here. I think most of those are, they have a new health system called Utah Navajo Health System. They've done a really good job um, bringing in uh, primary care providers and dentists. Um, but I think a lot of them are, are seeing individuals, you know, just people who come through the doors and, and they're working there. So when you look at, um, you know, some of these other factors, which is more global, uh, more holistic, that's why those numbers are, are in red there. Mental health providers, um, you know, they need more down there. Um, I know of one Navajo woman who worked with, um, I think the state of Utah, she's a, a licensed social worker. She retired from Utah, she's now with the Utah Navajo Health System, and she seems to be the only one, you know, who is local and who could speak the language, who can work with the population down there. So we need more mental health um, people there. Um, diabetes monitoring, um, fewer people doing that, mammography screening quite low compared to about 60% um, for the state rate. The environment, air and water quality, housing and transit, and again, um, 
housing is a huge problem down there. I know that there's a program through the University of Utah School of Architecture. They're, they're working with some families down there. But, um, but it's still a problem. So that's how it looks down in San Juan County. And those are Bears Ears that are uh, being um, contested right now. The Native people wanting to preserve this because this is a place that they have used over the years where they go for um, medicinal herbs, um, for food, um, hunting, plants, um, nuts, nut gathering, um, collecting firewood for their homes. And all the tribes that live there have used this. And of course, the Hopi from Arizona have, you know, their ancestors have been there. Um, and so they've all come together, over 20 tribes or so, um, and uh, sent a proposal to Congress and to the president saying that they want to preserve this as a place they can use um, like they've always done. Um, Montezuma Creek, this is um, on the reservation. I, I was hoping that you could see the housing. You can't really see it very well. But a lot of people live in um, mobile homes. And, um, and then some are um, houses, but usually substandard. Um, there's still people living without um, running water, um, some without electricity. Um, and of course, if they do get these, of course, you know, they have to pay. And, and some don't have a consistent way of, you know, paying or coming up with payment for these things. So they might get shut off. The same thing with cell phones. A lot of, you'll see a lot of people carrying cell phones around. But, um, you know, it's something that goes like from month to month. Um, so, yeah, employment and uh, we already looked at that. Um, so this is when the Yellow River came through. Um, people were getting uh, water through these trucks. Um, and this is all along the San Juan River where um, Navajo people were living. Um, this was in Montezuma Creek, Shiprock. You know, the same thing happened there. Um, the president of the Navajo Nation and the vice president are out there with an EPA person. Um, so, and then another thing, I, I, I'm talking a lot about San Juan County because I, you know, I spent quite a bit of time there the last um, year and a half. Um, and this is something that um, came up quite a bit, not just with the Navajo population, but also with the northern um, San Juan population. It, it's interesting when you go down there, there's the northern county and the southern county. You know, <laughs> um, the northern county are the white people, the southern county are the <laughs> Indian people. So there's this, and then someone calls it the Mason-Dixon line there. Um, so it's, it's kind of the same thing, really. You know, there's, there's discrimination and those kinds of things playing out. Um, but the Navos were not known for smoking, and therefore they were not coming down with lung cancer. So in the 60s, um, Navajo men were coming in, coughing and um, coughing out blood and um, having chest pains, and it turns out, you know, they had lung cancer, and so people explored this further, and it turns out these were their uranium miners, um, and there are a lot of uranium mines still, you know, they're closed down, but um, they, uh, they're still scattered across uh, southern Utah in the reservation and also off the reservation in those areas. And so once um, people have had this experience, they just absolutely said, no, no more uranium mining. And just recently, you know, we've heard th some discussions about trying to open up some mines, and, and Navajo people said no. Um, but, you know, I've read stories about how um, people living near um, tailings, um, you know, they would use some of the yellow dirt to plaster their walls, the inside of their homes, so that you know they glowed at night, and then realized this was so dangerous, and they were exposed. You know, I mean, this is environmental injustice, is what what this is all about. And so you see a lot of abandoned mines, and and it takes you know so much to clean it up, and you know, they people keep talking about it, and I'm not sure when they're going to get to the bottom of it. 
Um, so just briefly, the 10 leading causes of mortality between American Indian Alaska Native on the left and um, U.S. all races. Um, first two are the same. Um, unintentional injury rates are very high, and this is among um, children, you know, all the way up. And I think this is one reason why um, I was listening to um, one of the speakers the other day from South Dakota, and he said, in South Dakota, the um, life expectancy for um, Indian men was 48, 48 years old. And so I think a lot of it has to do with unintentional injuries um, and, and then some of the, the other um, um, conditions added to that. Um, chronic liver disease, you can see that's number five, and you don't see it on the list over here on the right-hand side. Um, suicide rates are, are high. Um, there were some discussions about that at the meeting, and um, we, we bring in some elders to try to um, help us go through some of this and discuss this, and, and uh, you know, they, they, just, they said, we just don't have the answers. We just have to, you know, go from day to day and figure these out. Just do all the things that, you know, we were taught to do and uh, try to get to the bottom of them. Um, so I've done some work in the Northern Plains, and these are the, the five states where um, Native people live that are included in the Great um, Plains um, um, Tribal um, Health Board. Um, and my work there was was in cancer, and um, and we found that you know, it's true here and true with all you know across Indian country was that the screening rates are low. You know, people are not coming in um, for prevention. They're not getting screened. Um, they're not um, going in for um, clinical breast exams, for mammograms, for pap tests, uh, colonoscopies. Um, and, um, and then I've been part of, um, involved in studies where people are, are saying, well, instead of colonoscopies, um, because sometimes they don't have the equipment, let's do uh, fecal occult blood testing and, and then start there, and then we can refer out uh, for colonoscopies. Um, so there's a lot of education going on in, in that area. Um, one of the things we did with cancer in this um, uh, the group that Joan mentioned is that we wanted to look at cancer rates, try to improve cancer uh, data because it was just you know all over the place. So, so we did a lot of work the last ten years, I think, and and really improved um, our cancer data so that um, you know people can use them and you know it's more descriptive and and you can see where there are needs um, in terms of. Um, um, clinical provision, education, research, you know, that sort of thing. Again, food insecurities and some of the things that um, um, children can experience later on, um, diabetes, bone density issues, emotional behavioral problems, And just a little bit more, some of the indicators that are used to define food insecurity. Again, child poverty. And Indian children, Indian elders, teachers. Um, like I mentioned, suicide is is something that is is um, very sensitive, um, very emotional, very difficult. Um, last summer, many of us um, got these emails that started um, from the Northern Plains, talking about this that. Um, this is what our children are experiencing right now. And so, you know, people were asking for help. Do you have counselors out there? We need them here. Um, so we had um, 
for those of us who have access to emails, we're able to send um, emails around and, and I think people got some help. But, you know, it's just one crisis, you know, where we try to help. But, you know, this is an ongoing thing. Um, I was in um, Pine Ridge one time with um, our Native Research Network conference was there and we took a group down through the reservation and, and went to the uh, center where there's a lot of counseling and, and, uh, and they told us the same thing. We have a lot of attempts, um, like 50 attempts per month. So, and, and you hear um, how Pine Ridge is one place, you know, with the, the most poverty, uh, the most poor county in the country is, is how it's been described. Um, and so it's just a really, um, a beautiful place, beautiful people, but just a really difficult um, place in terms of um, suicide. Um, going to the west, the west direction, ina, purpose, life, existence. Um, so what do we do? You know, what, for those of us in um, the health sciences, those of us who, um, uh, or students, um, those of us who are able to do something about it, what do we do? I think we can begin to look at um, the health professions education. I know this is very wordy. This comes from my good friend Don Warren, who's... Um, um, Oglala Lakota and he was at the the meeting and a lot of his work is in health policy he's a family physician um, he's director of the North Dakota State University's um, American Indian uh, Masters in Public Health program it's the only MPH program in the country that um, you know you can learn about Native American health and and get an MPH in that area so um, he does a lot of policy work, so he talks about how before we do anything, we need to look at history. You know, what are the policies um, that are out there that are relevant uh, to American Indian health? We've gone through all these different phases, for instance, uh, removal from our homeland, removal from our homes, um, forced assimilation into boarding schools and other settings. Um, reorganization of her uh, government and even termination in some cases like in Utah the uh, Paiute Indians of Utah there's several different bands of Paiutes down in south central um, Utah were terminated uh, it's just one of those federal government policies that you know comes about like this and um, so now we're in this tribal self-determination era and uh, so being a native person, you just never know what's going to go through the halls of Congress and what kind of policy we're going to be living under um, the next day. So there are several reports that were issued. Um, one was this um, by the Institute of Medicine, the IOM report released in 2002, Unequal Treatment. Um, and they looked at, you know, said there certainly are disparities um, in the different groups of populations making up the uh, United States. Um, there were um, discrimination, prejudice, biases, um, various things when it comes to health care. Um, health care providers were not treating people equally. Um, healthcare systems were not treating people equally. So, so that's the report that came out in uh, 2000. Um, it was requested by Congress, and, um, and it looked at a lot of different factors. They, they looked at, um, made a lot of recommendations. There were eight major recommendations, and each one had a, a sub-recommendation. So there were several recommendations looking at how to deal with these um, inequalities, um, health disparities. And then there was another report came out um, in 2004, and this was the Sullivan Commission report, um, named after Dr. Lewis Sullivan. Um, I saw him 
last month at a meeting and he's still going strong. He's an older person now. Um, but um, this was the missing, per missing persons report. You know, they looked at um, all the various um, professions and African American, Hispanics, and then the Native people were missing. You know, their numbers were so small uh, compared to the other um, populations. Um, they made up 25% of the U.S. population, but less than 10% of uh, these three um, major health professions. And so the report looked at where are they, what do we do? Um, they made 37 recommendations and these were the guiding principles that they use um, to look at these recommendations. They went around the country, um, held uh, town halls, interviewed some people. Um, Dr. Ben Manita is a Navajo physician who represented the Native people on this uh, commission. The IOM report had Dr. Jenny Jo, who um, uh, was at that time teaching at the University of Arizona. She's a public health person. She represented our population on the IOM report. So we were represented. Um, and then um, research is another area that um, I think we can do something um, to correct some of these disparities. We talk about doing respectful research. Um, this is a copy of our Navajo Earth Report that we did. We did this um, five-year study um, in the Northern Plains, um, Navajo land, and Alaska. Um, we enrolled um, about 15,000 people, and we were hoping that you know this study would go, I don't know, 20 years or so. And we got funded from the National Cancer Institute, but. Um, we could only go five years because they said, oh, it's too expensive. We can't, we can't you know, have you keep enrolling more people and, and doing this um, longitudinal study. It, it's too expensive. Um, and we started it here, from here, from the University of Utah. Um, we wanted to look at um, the um, etiology of cancer and why is it that cancer rates vary across Native American populations. For instance, Alaska and the Northern Plains had the highest cancer rates. Um, high breast cancer rates in Alaska, high lung cancer rates in the Northern Plains. Um, in Navajo, um, things like kidney cancer, um, gallbladder cancer, you know, the high rates there. Um, and so we wanted to know why, and but um, the National Cancer Institute said, no, it's too expensive, you can't, you can't do that. We can't fund you to do that. So, but we did do a nice um, baseline um, report, I think, for the Navajo people. We put on a two-day conference for them and gave them all the, you know, shared with them all the findings of that report, and, and this was the cover. Um, and so Native people want, you know, when you come into their areas, they want to make sure that you have all the necessary approvals to do research. Um, some have formal tribal IRBs. Um, some might have um, uh, a small group of people looking, uh, reviewing research that you're going to do, and some might have you come before the tribal council. Um, so it just varies, and then they want community buy-in. Um, the leaders might not be enough. You might have to, with Navajo, we have to go through all the um, major chapter, chapter houses that are called where we're going to work. So we did that, you know, are there incentives? Um, are you going to hire local people, train them, um, teach them how to do research? Um, and are we going to share resources? Um, and then um, what they want, and this is especially true in Navajo, we have a really tough um, woman who is chair of our IRB, and everybody calls her Madam Chair. You know, they don't go call her by name, it's Madam Chair. So Madam Chair, if you come before her when you finish your study and say, these are all the things we found, you know, you have more of this, more of that, you know, all negative things, she will say, isn't there one good thing you found among our people? I want you to go back, look at all your data, look at, pick out the good things also. 
how are you, we going to use those good things to sustain us? Because all those negatives will not help us. You know, we know that you know, we have issues with health. We know that. But you also need to look at the, the positive things. So, so that's what tribes want. Um, so when you report back, that, that's, you know, if you do research out there, that's what they'll ask you. Um, there are workshops and training uh, going on. I went to this one last summer at UC Davis, um, co-sponsored by the American Indian um, AEIP, Association of American Indian Physicians. And um, uh, these are students, and it's not just students who are interested in medical school, it's just health professional students is what these um, students were. 20 of them came in. Um, most of them were from Oklahoma for some reason. I thought they would be from Nevada and Oklahoma, or California, and they were mostly from <laughs> um, Oklahoma. But, you know, they spent a, a really um, good three days getting oriented to what it's like to get into the health professions. Um, they did some hands-on work. They had some lectures. They went into the communities to ch um, look at um, uh, clinics. Um, to see what physicians, what nurses, what PAs do, um, how they work with the, the community. So it was a very good orientation, and, and so I think we can do more of this um, with the, the Native students, the few Native students that we have um, in our health science and in, in our university. Um, th this is an organization that Joan mentioned that I work with. Um, we co-founded this um, organization um, back in 1997 or so, and, and it's the only one of its kind in Native people, and we really promote good research, what we call respectful community-based research. And we have um, a conference every year. Um, and uh, where we bring in students, we bring in elders, we bring in community health workers who work on these um, studies. Um, we train um, the tribal IRBs. Um, and in fact, uh, the next one is June 5 through the 8th in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, and the theme will be finding the balance, sacred places and healthy environments. Um, so if any of you are interested, through the American Public Health Association, we also, um, I chair the, the development committee, so I'm always out there looking for funds, and I, I have been getting some money from the CDC the past few years, and so we bring in eight students. Two of them, previous students, are here. Um, they did presentations this year. This is like two or three years later. They've come back, and, and now they're out in the workforce, and. Uh, Dania and White is working for Johns Hopkins, and Joaquin at the end is working for the University of Colorado and planning on going to law school. So, you know, we're really proud of these Native students, and, and we have Alaska Native, American Indians, and Native Hawaiians represented um, in this group, um, and they really enjoy it. Um, I mentioned Ben Manita um, on this commission, the Sullivan Commission. Um, he's a family uh, practitioner. Um, and this was, you know, some of his um, thoughts that he felt that providers, you know, see us, you know, as poor Indian people. And, um, and they're asking why, why waste resources you know, on people so people weren't valued. Um, so a lot of this kind of thing came out from that report. So if we have our own people, um, students who are brought into the health professions who go back to work with these communities, and many of them do, the majority of people who are Native people who are trained will go back and work with their, their own communities. Um, just looking at, um, this is from the Sullivan Report, so these, these numbers are a little bit different now, but still um, it's small. The American Indian Alaska Native Physicians number is still quite <coughs> small. And then nursing, the same thing. Um, there are all kinds of reports coming out for nursing, and I don't know if many nursing programs are meeting those challenges. 
um, oops. So here um, we're talking about um, nursing faculty. How many African American um, nursing faculty are there back in 2003 or so? Only about five, six percent. Um, American Indians, less than 0.5 percent. So huge disparities. Um, and then this is something recent that's going on within nursing. Um, HRSA um, issued a report um, looking at, you know, what can we do? And this program is called We Can. CAN stands for Changing Admissions in Nursing. Um, and using what's called holistic reviews rather than just looking at GPAs, could we do a more holistic review of applications to bring the numbers of um, the various ethnic minority students up um, and all the others um, professions, you know, were up there in the 80, 90 percent um, using holistic reviews, but nursing was down at 47. So, um, and, and the others were reporting that good changes were taking place, that um, there's more diversity in the students when they use holistic reviews. Uh, students are more engaged in communities. Uh, there's cooperation, teamwork among students. Uh, students are open to more and uh, different ideas. So, um, so what this this group did is they wanted to look at nursing. Why why was nursing you know so low? Um, and um, so they took 66 um, schools of nursing, colleges of nursing, um, but there was only a 50% response rate. And um, however, you know, there were some changes. There were some good changes that, you know, that they saw just within this small sample that they looked at. Um, they asked the deans um, why was there non-participation, and these are some of the reasons they gave. Um, for lack of participation. So I thought that was, you know, pretty interesting what, what they did. And I think um, the pressure is on nursing to try to improve some of those numbers. Okay, so this is the last direction. The north direction, C, has seen is stability, balance, bringing Huizhong, um, completing that circle. Um, so like I said, we want to look at what are the strengths in the communities, what are the strengths in the students that we're working with, or even in the patient population that we're working with. Um, these are just some things that, that I've listed there. I'm sure, you know, those of you in the audience can come up with others. Um, we have clans, you know, we, a lot of times we introduce ourselves, you know, and say I'm turtle clan or I'm elk clan or whatever. Um, and then we have our elders, you know, we treasure our elders, we have family, we have youth, um, we have our traditional values, we have our song. At APHA, we were talking about suicide um, one day, and this young man um, got up and he said, you know, we are talking about suicide. We cannot just stop the discussion here because time is up and walk out. We have to have the right closing. And so he stood up and sang a song. So that brought everybody, you know, together. And so they won't feel like that circle is, is incomplete before we walked out the door. So, so that's a strength. And so I, you know, stories are also very important. Our teachings, the knowledge, um, native um, science knowledge um, is in there, resilience. Uh, traditional Indian medicine, TIM, our land, um, that's all we have. A lot of times people ask, well, you know, if there are all these problems with Indian health and that sort of thing, why do people want to hang on uh, to the reservation? Why do they want to stay in the reservation? That's all the land we have. You know, all of our land's been taken and this is, this is what's left. So we hang on to the land. Um, this is the logo for our Earth study. Um, Earth stands for um, education and research towards health. And so we had a Navajo Earth, Alaska Earth, and Northern Plains Earth when we did this study. Um, so the theme at APHA was health in all policies, but you know we also said you know we should have health equity in all policies um, through collaborations, partnerships, um, statewide efforts. 
uh, paid attention to these national reports and recommendations uh, that come out and thinking health and everything we do. Um, and that includes like tribal, tribal um, councils. Um, um, I'm working with a, a tribe right now and, and we have this contract and it's a health contract and they keep pushing it down. You know, they think there are all these other things that are more important. But if we're thinking health in all policies, if we're thinking health equity, you know, we should be looking at all of those things. And these are my pride and joy. Um, I have a daughter who's an MD. She's a second year OBGYN resident. And then um, the other one is almost uh, a doctorate in veterinary medicine. So, so I'm trying to do my part. And, uh, <laughs> um, and so um, just the la a last thought um, from Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, if we're gonna build this culture of health in America, and that's in all the subpopulations, we've really got to look at um, you know, all of these issues that we talked about. Um, our race, our ethnicity, our socioeconomic status shouldn't dictate you know, whether or not we get health or you know, how long we live. We should all be striving you know, for the same thing. Um, so thank you. That's all I have. I think we have time, yeah, for a few Can questions. questions. I'm just wondering, Lillian, in terms you know, of, of Utah and the University of Utah, you know, like it, it, sometimes this looks so overwhelming as, you know, like, what, what can we do as, as you have done the work that you, you've done? What do you see as the, um, the most important way that, that the University of Utah can, and, and particularly the University of Utah Health Sciences, what can we do? Um, <laughs> well, there's a lot. I think, that, I think we are beginning to do a lot more than, than we've done, for instance, with um, Dr. Lopez coming in in the Office of Health Equity and Inclusion. You know, just having this sort of thing, you know, just having um, these discussions, making them public, um, I'm working through that office, I'm working at um, what are groups out there in the community that we, we can work with. Uh, for instance, through the Utah State of Education, there are these what's called um, Title VII programs. So I'm gonna be sitting in on their meetings to see what they're talking about and see if there are ways that we from Health Science can work with them. Um, you know, they have access to students um, throughout the state. They have these coordinators that come in from all parts of the state. Um, and their next meeting, I think, is coming up in December. So we're trying to see, you know, how we can capture some of these kids and maybe provide summer opportunities, have them come and see the university, because a lot of these kids have never seen a university. Um, they don't know what, you know, what we mean when we say college or university. Um, even kids on the, south, uh, the west side, um, you know, this is the ivory tower, they, they don't come here. So just introducing them to this sort of thing. Um, usually with native students, there are issues with um, uh, math, science, reading, writing. Um, so introducing kids to reading um, so they can enjoy reading. Um, I think you know that helps. Just you know, small. It, they seem like small things, but I think um, I think those things will help them at the end. For me, fortunately, my my children went to a very nice school with very nice teachers. One of them sitting here, and uh, exposed to just wonderful, open-minded people. And and they were they both started reading at an early age, and they continued to love to read just for fun. And so. Um, so I think that's why they're, they're doing, doing well. But just a lot of support in many of the homes, the, the family dynamics are such that, you know, there's not cohesiveness, there isn't support. Um, I was visiting St. Christopher's Mission down in Bluff um, and the Father Red and I were talking and he said, you know, I was trying to get a history of St. Christopher's because way back in the, 1940s, 50s, um, it was a place that 
people, Navajo people living in the surrounding areas would come for health care. And it's not a health care center. It's, it's an Episcopal mission. <laughs> and, and so they started a little clinic. They started a little place where women can come and deliver. So, you know, several people that I know were delivered there. Um, and so now they, you know, they closed all of that now. So now they said, you know, we have women coming in with their children needing a place to go because of domestic violence in the homes now. And they've gone to Blanding, and Blanding there has a center, but they were told that Blanding were only here from eight to five, so so no domestic violence, I guess you know between five p.m. and eight a.m. So you know they joked about that, but they said you know we just really need something. We we want those students to be safe. We want those kids not to miss school. Uh, we want them to have a safe place to be. So just a lot of support, whatever support I think you can think of, you know, for, for whatever age, you know, even little children. I know down in, in Shiprock on the reservation, some of the physicians started bringing little books in for children in the pediatrics clinic and just giving out these books for, for children, just really easy reading books. Um, so just one way to you know, introduce different ideas that children can maybe catch on to, to reading. Did you have a question well, back there? I'm going to say that we've, we've got, I know we have some students who have to get back to their lectures um, in the middle of the day, so I want to let them um, be able to, to leave, but we, um, would, are you able to stay, Lillian? I can stay for a few minutes, for yeah. For a few more minutes, and, and people can ask um, some more questions, but I wanted to be able to give people the, um, the opportunity to leave if you need mm -hmm. to. So thank See you ya. so much, Lillian, for coming. Okay. Thank you. And, okay. okay.